Now, when my wife and I went to Africa back in 1945, we had just the customary training that you'd get in a very fine Bible school. And so we didn't have very high expectations as to what the people that had never seen a missionary or heard the name of Jesus knew. But when I went into the Ganza tribe along the Sudan-Ethiopian border, who said I was the first one ever to come with the Bible, first one ever to mention to them the name of Jesus, I found out that these people knew an amazing amount, far more than I'd ever been led to expect they knew. For instance, they knew God had made the world. All you had to do is break off a stick or pick up a stone or anything and say, who made it? And they gave you the name. In this case, it was Wanamish. And that he was holy, and he was angry with them because of their sin. All they also knew about Satan, that he was evil, that he was bad. Now, they didn't sacrifice to God, to Wanamish. Why don't you bring your chickens to Wanamish? And they said, we don't even know that he wants chickens. We can't waste them on him. If we don't know that's what he wants. We know that if we don't take our chickens to the evil spirits, our goats will die and our crops won't mature. And so we got to save all the chickens we got for the ones who want them, for the evil spirits. So uh, they knew that, that God was, but there was no fear of God before their eyes. Oh, they knew he was going to punish them when they died. But uh, they were so worried about how to survive till the harvest that they couldn't be particularly concerned about what was going to happen when they died. Now, I began to say they, they knew God was angry with them because of what they had done, was the way they put it. Well, what have you done that he's angry with? And they said, well, we've lied. Have you ever heard of that? I mean, it seems somewhat familiar to Ten Commandments, doesn't it? And, uh, and what else have you done? Well, we've stolen he doesn't want you. No, we can't steal. Well, have you stole? Oh, yes. And what else? Well, you can't kill. And I remember turned to one man, have you ever killed? He said, are you with the government? <laughs> and I said, no, I, I'm here just to study your language and talk to you about Jesus. Yeah, I've killed. And so is he, so is he, so is he. Accusing one another, you know, he didn't want to be all alone there. Now, they knew it was wrong to lie and to steal and to kill. Now, who taught them? They'd never seen the Bible. They'd never heard the name of Jesus. They never had introduction to the Ten Commandments. So how in the world would they know that? Well, you might be surprised. In uh, Romans, the second chapter, uh, Paul writes saying, when the Gentiles, that's the pagans, people I talk to, who have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, and show that they have a law, the law is written on their hearts. You see, every model of the human family that's been come off the assembly line. Everybody that's ever been born of human parents is standard equipment. And the standard equipment for a human being is the law written on the heart. Now, I referred to this marvelous sermon by Charles Finney. Now, he used uh, an illustration appropriate to his day. In his day, flour mills consisted of having a big stone that had had lines cut in it, the grooves cut into it, and they had a, a means with a water wheel so that this one, the lower stone would go one way, and then there was an upper stone, and it would go the other way. Now, it's hard for you to get you to do your hands. Now, you might want to try it. It's hard to get one hand going one way and the other and keep them going. It won't work. But you get it with, with, with millstone. And so what Finney said was this, that when you bring the outer revelation 
of the law in the word to bear upon the inner revelation written on the heart, the human spirit is caught between and is ground. Uh, that is, the skull is taken off, the sophistication is taken away, and they're brought under conviction of sin. Now, the upper millstone is the law written. And the lower millstone is the law in the heart. And this is why wherever we go, any place in the world, you can always bring the revelation of the holiness of God and the law of God down upon the person that's there, knowing that the Spirit of God is going to cause that preparation of the heart for grace. You see, without that upper millstone lowered, the conduct just rests on the lower millstone and it just rides around and there's no abrasion and no pressure, no friction, and they're content. But when you bring the word of God down, and the human spirit is there, and human conduct is there, and it begins to be ground. Now you see why it says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And the law gives, the, gives to sin the character of exceeding sinfulness and transgression. And it's therefore imperative that we learn how to use the law in such a way that it is going to cause the human spirit to undergo this work of being shredded and, 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 rigged and, and ripped and, and crushed and, and ground. Now, just as we gave you verses having to do with awakening, so I'm asking you to do your homework and to gather for yourself verses that you find congenial to your mind and your spirit that you're going to use with people that have been awakened but are not yet under conviction. And one of the good places to start is with the Ten Commandments. How many of you learned them when you were children in school, Sunday school? Well, how many of you remember them all? You can pass a test on you. If I were you, I'd go back and do a little refreshing on that because you'd be astonished the way the Spirit of God is pleased to use the revelation of the holiness of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as it's given there in the Ten Commandments. That's the law. But the law is not restricted to it, of course. Everything that indicates the holiness of God is, in effect, that teaching, that Torah, that unveiling of the heart to the individual. Now, some of the effects of the law applied to the conscience are, are unrest, distress, uh, concern, uh, uh, just unhappiness. Something's the matter. I'm not getting any pleasure out of this anymore. Unrest will give way to a burden. Just sort of is something we call it, you psychologists call it depression. But it's a burden on the mind and on the spirit. And a lot of people that are depressed try to escape from it, uh, thinking that it's something they shouldn't have when it's the spirit of God dealing with them about their sin. In Psalm 51, 3, David talked about misery. His sin was ever before him, and it caused misery in his heart. In Acts, we're told that they had the sting of conscience. Their, their, their minds were stung by what they heard from Peter. In Acts 24, 35, 25, we are told that uh, terror struck their hearts. All of these things accompanied by conviction.